as we get underway. But uh, I appreciate everybody making time to join us. So, so let's not uh, waste any more time. Um, as you guys know, Aparo hosts periodic webinars to share topics of interest that may have application in your world. And we hope that today's topic will too. Uh, we have a guest speaker today, David Phillips from Faster Glass, who has agreed to come and share some of his expertise with us on how to approach thinking about solving problems. Um, you know, we're in a different world these days, as you guys know, and, you know, we got to thinking about, hey, as we start to approach this thing called maybe normal, you know, what do we need to do differently, if anything, to think about how to move forward? And so, you know, David has some, some tools and techniques, I think, that we can tap into to help us think about how to approach solving our problems as we come back to, to full face-to-face -face operations, we hope, in the next several months. And uh, yeah, just give us some new ways of thinking about problem solving. So um, what we'll do is hand this off to David to introduce himself, tell us a little bit about you and your firm, and then we'll hop right into the content. Perfect, perfect. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. David Phillips with Faster Glass. Uh, a couple familiar faces on the screen. Uh, for those of you who haven't op had the opportunity to meet yet, uh, so I'm the founder of Faster Glass. We're an innovation consulting firm based in Charlotte. Started the firm in 2010 simply as a way to help people and organizations learn how to see and think and work differently so that they can then drive meaningful, sustainable change within their organizations, their communities, their companies, what have you. Our work is really built around the discipline of design thinking, but we also borrow from other disciplines such as uh, behavioral insights and systems thinking, appreciative inquiry. And so uh, thrilled to have the opportunity to share with you some information today that we picked up over the years, particularly around this concept of rethinking, like why and then how might we do it? And what are some very specific tools? So I'm gonna share some info with you today. Some of it's stuff you know, some of it's stuff you know, but maybe packaged a little differently and some of it may be new. Uh, and I love when we have small groups like this, we can, it's much more of an intimate conversation. Um, but and I'll uh, mention this again here in a bit, but by all means, if questions or comments or ahas come up as I'm chatting, just please put those in the Zoom chat and then we'll have time at the end for a, a, a rather lengthy discussion and some Q and A. So does that sound worth doing? Awesome, then let's do this. Let me share my screen and we'll get rolling. All right, so Jennifer, are we seeing a single slide? We are seeing a single slide. Excellent, then everything worked properly. We'll see how long that holds. <laughs> All right, so today's topic is called Drop Your Tools, Rethinking the Road Ahead. So I want you to imagine that you're a firefighter. Let me get this out of my way. I you to imagine you're a firefighter, but not just any firefighter. Right? You're a smoke jumper. You're part of an elite team that parachutes into battle wildfires. And on this particular day, you're part of a 15-person team that lands near the top of a ridge, and there's a fire you see visible across the gulch, on the other side of the gulch. You make your way down the slope. You and your team are going to dig a line in the dirt to contain the fire. But after you've hiked about a quarter mile downhill, the fire then leaps across the gulch. Now it's on your side, and it's coming straight at you. Flames 30 feet in the air, racing through dry grass at 11 feet per second. That's about seven and a half miles per hour, far faster than we can run in this, in this environment. So it's time to switch from fight to flight. We begin running back up the slope. That's an extremely steep, in, steep incline. So think 70 degrees or more, high grass, rocky terrain. We're able to cover a lot of ground, but you're now about 200 yards from safety. It does not look like you're going to make it. What do you do? So what I just described, tragically, were the conditions of the Man Gulch Fire in Montana in 1949, which 12 smoke jumpers and one other firefighter died. Now, it's easy to say that the fire was the cause of their death, uh, but you can make an argument there was another contributing factor, and that factor was their inability to rethink in the moment. So let's look, let's look closer at the three who survived. So one was the foreman, a guy named Wag Dodge, and the first thing he did actually made no sense to anybody else on the team. He actually started another fire, right? As they're running uphill, 
he takes out his matches and lights the grass in front of him on fire. He's like, hey, guys, come join me. And no one joined him, but it's kind of understandable because no one had ever done that before. They'd never seen that before. It didn't make any sense. Why is he starting a fire when we're trying to run from fire? Turns out Dodge really invented what's now become known as the escape fire, right? Take the fuel away from the main fire that's coming. But again, no one joined him. But there was another missed opportunity for this crew to rethink, and it involved their tools, namely if they could have dropped them. See, smoke jumpers, right? They're jumping into the fire. They got to take everything with them, right? So axes and saws and shovels and water and, you know, 20-pound backpacks, what have you. So one of the things Dodge did when he said, hey, guys, one, drop your tools, two, come join me. A few dropped their tools, but a lot didn't. And it, and it cost them, right? Because you've got all this weight in, uh, as you're trying to get uphill in these really, really tough conditions. So a lot has been written about and learned from the Man Gulch fire, and it absolutely has improved the way wildfires are fought. However, in four separate fires in the 1990s, there were 23 elite wildland firefighters who refused to drop their tools and, and they perished beside them. In fact, in one case, investigators came back and said and determined that the crew could have moved anywhere from 15 to 20 percent faster had they simply dropped their gear and run for safety. So that brings us to two questions. One, why didn't they drop their tools? And two, what does this have to do with us and with, in, with nonprofits or organizations in general? Well, let's talk first about what it has to do with us. So as we emerge from the pandemic, and it seems like we're emerging from the pandemic, right? Fingers crossed. Our organizations have an opportunity, if not an obligation, to rethink what we do and how we do it. And this covers everything from our external programs to internal processes and policies. And the good news is that, well, fortunately, unfortunately, we've all had practice rethinking recently because we all had to adapt uh, to the various disruptions caused by COVID-19. So right, that's good, we've got some recent practice, but in some ways rethinking the road ahead may be a little harder because one, the forces of disruption now aren't gonna be as obvious, right? It looks like smooth sailing or smoother sailing. Uh, and then also we might have an inclination to simply go back to doing what we were doing right in the pre-pandemic life, right in the before times, that let's just go back to doing that again. And that can be risky. Rethinking in any situation requires us to relinquish some long held beliefs, requires us to identify and test assumption, and it requires us to unlearn habits of thinking and habits of doing. Organizational behavior expert Carl Weck says it this way, that basically what we have to do is to be able to drop our tools right? Because that's a proxy for unlearning, for adapting, for being flexible. Easy to say, harder to do. And so again, what I want to share with you today are some ideas and tools and techniques you can use to help your organization adapt to the road ahead. All right, before we get rolling, though, I think it's worth noting that we today, right, we very wise people today living in 2021 often chuckle at what people, you know, back then used to believe, you know, in some circles, they still believe right? Things like the earth is flat, or that bloodletting cures sickness, or that Columbus discovered America, or that the Dallas Cowboys are America's team, right? So that's what, you know, these, these silly people used to believe, but it's worth considering what our future selves or even what our future generations will think about what we hold true today. Here's the last little thing. If either of those last two items triggered even a faint hint of what? or resistance or cognitive dissonance, just hold on to that thought because know this, I'm not here to persuade you to change your mind. What I'm here to do is to invite you to consider what I'm gonna share with you so you can change your own mind when appropriate. All right, so again, if you've got questions, comments, as we, can, as we go through this, by, by all means, please put them in the Zoom chat. We'll have some time at the end of this for some, for some Q&A and some discussion. All right, so here we're going to really cover three main areas today. Uh, why we get stuck, how we can rethink, and some specific tools and techniques that you can take back to your organization. So let's talk about why we get stuck. Let's see where I am on time. All right, yes. Question? No, I was just saying it's 1213. Ah, perfect. Thank you. All right, so some barriers to rethinking. I'm going to give you three. We're going to do this in, in a series of three. So blind spots, identity, and experience plus success. So blind spots. Again, this isn't new, right? You know this already, that we all have blind spots in our knowledge and our opinions. Sometimes that's just because we don't know what we don't know. 
And other times our blindness might come from what we think we know, but just isn't so. Right, and the, you know, it's the blind men and the elephant over and over and over again, um, right? And if you know this fable, right, each blind man comes in contact with a different part of the elephant and is absolutely 100% sure that they know what's in front of them, right? That it's a snake or a wall or a rope or whatever. And that they stand firm in their perspective and they're willing to fight over who is right. But the other thing about our blind spots is often we're blind to our blindness, which gives us this false confidence in our judgment and, present and prevents us from rethinking. So that's one. Two, another force that keeps us from rethinking is identity, right? It's how we see ourselves. So let's go back to our smoke jumpers for a moment, right? So when you're a firefighter, it's not just what you do, right? It's who you are, right? You don't say, I work at the fire department. You say, I'm a firefighter, right? It's who I am. It becomes part of your identity. And in that occupation, the tools, the tools you use are also part of your identity. It's what you use to do the job, and it's what you use to keep you safe. And there's a book called Young Men in Fire, uh, uh, written by a guy named Norman McLean, which is the authoritative story of the Man Gulch Fire. And in it, he writes, when a firefighter is told to drop his firefighting tools, he is told to forget he is a firefighter. Right? Imagine in that moment, life or death, you're basically being told, stop being who you are. That, that's a lot to ask of anybody in any situation. But here's the thing, in addition to our tools, our beliefs also become part of our identity, right? Especially when they're really deeply held, long held convictions. And when those beliefs are called into question, when other people seem to be calling our beliefs or our identity into question, it feels like an attack. And when we know what happens when we're attacked, right? It's fight or flight. And one of the ways that we defend ourselves from these sorts of attacks, right? We have a lot of me different mechanisms to do that, but one of those is up here, so, right? It's through our cognitive biases. And two in particular I want to point out is confirmation bias and motivated reasoning. So confirmation bias, again, this is stuff I'm sure you already know, but it's when we seek out information that supports what we already think, right? You think climate change is the biggest threat facing humanity? Guess what? You can go to the magic Google box, find anything you want to support that position. You think climate change is the biggest hoax ever instituted on mankind, guess what? You can go to the magic Google box and find all sorts of stuff that supports that position. So confirmation bias can kind of keep us anchored into what we already think. And motivated reasoning is similar, but there's enough of a distinction I thought it would be worthwhile calling it out. So motivated reason is when we, when we get new information that doesn't fit what we already think, we'll, fit, we'll find a way to contort that information, to distort that information so that it does fit what we already believe. So those two biases are part of us just being human, but boy, they can really keep us locked into what we already believe. And lastly is this experience plus success, right? When we have a lot of experience in an area and we've been successful, well, why in the world would we change, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But we've all seen plenty of examples of where that did not lead to continued success. So, my guess is some of you, if many of you, if not all of you on the call at one point had a Blackberry. How many of you have a Blackberry now? Right, not so much. 2009, they had almost half of the US smartphone market. Five years later, less than 1%, right? Blackberry's done. You could ask the same thing, right? How many of you had a Blockbuster card? How many of you still have a Blockbuster card? Same deal. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Maybe, maybe not. And Jay, I know you know this quote because I got it from your team. Uh, but the novelist Evelyn, uh, Ellen Glasgow tells us that the only difference between a rut and a grave are the dimensions. And boy, it's really hard to see, to identify, to acknowledge, to appreciate when we're in a rut that's leading to a grave. So three barriers to rethinking, which leads to the question, what can we do differently? Good question. I'm glad you asked. Well, I think this quote from George Bernard Shaw really kind of sums it up. That in order for us to make progress, in order for us to move forward, we have to be able to and willing to change our minds. So that's really the argument I'm trying to make today. And of course, you're willing to change your mind. The point is, is that sometimes it's hard that we don't realize we are on a path, that we're in a rut that might be leading to our grave, either individually or organizationally, or perhaps for just some program. So how can we rethink? Well, again, back to the three. I'm going to share three things we can do. One, think like a scientist. Two, separate our beliefs from our identity. And three is to adopt a scout mindset. All right, so let's dig into these a little bit further. 
So what do we know about how scientists work, right? Scientists, one, they doubt what they know. They're curious about what they don't know. They develop hypotheses and they run experiments to test what they think and then update their, what they think based on those results, right? They update their views based on new information. So how can we, how might we think like scientists? Well, we should doubt what we know. We should be curious about what we don't know. We should develop hypotheses and then run experiments to test them. And then we should update our views based on new information that we get. Um, and I doubt anyone says, no, 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 I will never do that. That's, that's no way, that's not for me. And so it's not so much hard to appreciate. Sometimes though, it's just hard to do, but we're gonna keep going on that. So the second thing we can do to equip ourselves to rethink is to separate our beliefs from our identity. And boy, this is a tough one because there is so much packed into identity, right? Again, how we see ourselves, how we define ourselves. You know, a lot of times it's based on our beliefs or ideologies, where we come from. I mean, all sorts of things roll into that. But again, that can, that can prevent us from changing our minds, right? As our knowledge grows and the world changes, uh, in part because we don't want to seem wishy-washy, right? I don't want to be like, well, I believe this yesterday, but today I believe something different. Tomorrow, maybe I'll be back. You know, we don't really think highly of those people, and we don't want to be one of those people, so we, we have to stand firm, right? Well, here's another way to think about this, is that who we are should really be a question of what we value, not what we believe, right? Who we are should be a question of what we value and not what we believe, right? Our values are our core principles, where our beliefs can evolve as we gain more knowledge, as we gain more maturity. And so if we define ourselves by our values, it then gives us the flexibility to update our beliefs and our behaviors. Because we're like, oh, now I know something new. I can now go a different direction. I heard a quote from a client recently I absolutely love. She said, she says she tells her team, I reserve the right to get smarter. I just, I just love that. <laughs> love that. All right, the last thing in terms of equipping ourselves to rethink is to adopt a scout mindset. So what do we mean by scout mindset? Well, this phrase comes to us from a woman named Julia Galef. She has an absolutely brilliant TED talk called Why You Think You're Right Even If You're Wrong. Actually, she just released a book earlier this year called The Scout Mindset. And it, anyway, she makes the argument that soldiers attend any military, right? You have two main roles, soldiers and scouts. And soldiers, their job is to attack and defend, where the scout, their job is to go search for what's true, right? The map says there is a river or there's a bridge on the river right across this mountain. They get to the top of the mountain and there's no bridge across the river there. Well, the scout can't make an argument, can't say, well, this is what I believe. I'm, this is just how it is, right? They have to update the map. And so the scout mindset is the motivation to see things as they are and not as, they, not as we wish them to be. So how might we do that? Well, it's as simple as and as hard as asking ourselves questions. You know, we find ourselves going, well, here's what I know. Well, how do I know that? You know, what makes me think that? And what if, what if I'm wrong? And sometimes just prompting ourselves to ask simple questions like that can sort of detach us from getting too anchored to a particular position. Now, it doesn't mean that we're wrong, but it means that we're willing to ask, how do I know that that's true? And why do I think that? And, and what if I'm wrong? And to me, it kind of goes hand in hand with the reserving the right to get smarter. It's just that, again, there's no benefit to being wrong longer, right? There's no trophy. There's no reward. There's no medal. I was wrong the longest. Yes. Yay me. Not so much. So again, three things we can equip ourselves to rethink, thinking like a scientist, separating beliefs from identity, and adopting a scout mindset. All right, I'm going to pause here before I go a little bit further, again, because we've got a small group, we can actually have, con we kind of break up our conversation instead of saving all for the end. So if what you have heard so far, questions, comments, ahas, is this relevant to you and or your organization? Talk to me, Goose. Hey, David, this is Stephen. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah, I think all of this is very helpful. I think it's just important to take a time out from the thrust, the momentum of your work. 
and just to think these things. And I think a lot of people are willing to uh, think these things if they carve out the time to reflect. And I think there's, a, uh, there's an overarching um, personal practice here of just reflecting. And if you reflect enough on what a lot of the uh, people know about all of these things, they're likely know about many of these things, just taking time to reflect it's easier to put it into action if you just carve out the time. It's not necessarily an epiphany, but to take time to value it. Totally agree, Stephen, because to me what that does, right, that carving out time to, to think intentionally and to rethink intentionally is a practice. And with that practice, it can lead to some of these other practices. Totally agree. Other, other thoughts, other reactions so far? I was just, I was thinking about hmm. I think we might have had a little audio problem there. David, are you there? Can you hear?